be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest like sailors in a tempest together and it could be just you and me we'll be family just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Um, so some of you may or may not know me. My name is Danielle Hicks. Uh, I work at the foundation. I oversee patient uh, programs and services. I am Bonnie Adario's oldest daughter. My sister always wants to make sure that, that I put the oldest part in first. Um, and I've been working at the foundation for about 11 years. Um, uh, foundation was started, for some of you who may or may not know, back in 2006, uh, three years after Bonnie's original diagnosis. She was diagnosed with stage 3B. Um, uh, she had a tumor in her upper left lobe that had attached to her uh, aorta, aorta and subclavian arteries. So they were, she was told there was really nothing that they could do for her. And back in 2003, there really wasn't. Um, I'm happy to say uh, that through a series of very ser serendipitous events, chemotherapy, radiation up front, uh, a lobectomy, uh, some work from a cardiac team on the vessels in her heart, uh, she just on Sunday, uh, St. Patrick's Day celebrated 15 years of being cancer free. So um, she decided that if she came out the other side of this, she was going to do something to give back. Um, uh, like I said, a lot has changed since 2003, but back then, multidisciplinary care, particularly in the community setting, was not a thing. Um, it didn't happen. It still doesn't happen a lot in a lot of communities. Um, we're going to talk about what that, uh, what that looks like here. Um, in Arizona um, with this great group of docs that are here in the room tonight. So with that, um, I'm going to turn, um, turn this meeting over to Dr. Quo to start. So, Dr. Quo. Okay. My name is Dr. Quo, and I get to work with these wonderful people on this journey of lung cancer. I really want to thank Bonnie Adario for giving us the opportunity to really share what we're doing in Arizona and what we're doing for our patients and help lung cancer patients actually throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, really, my passion about lung cancer is putting together a team to change the way we treat lung cancer and the journey for the patient. Really, the patient journey is what is the most important, and we're not doing a very good job of it today. I think the average time from diagnosis to treatment for lung cancer in the United States can be over five and a half months. I'm sure many people in the room are listening have lived that journey, where you go from your primary care doctor to a pulmonologist, get a CT scan, go back to your pulmonologist, get a biopsy, just takes a long time. What we're really trying to do here at Banner MD Anderson, both on the east side, where um, Dr. Briard, Dr. New, and Dr. Walker are right now on their team, is to create a better experience for the patients, where you can come in, and I, we brought many people from the team here that I get the privilege to work with to help in that journey and change that time from diagnosis to treatment to down to three weeks, down to two weeks, down to a time where you can get together, see everybody at once, get all your tests coordinated. So I'd really like to just take this time to, open up, to introduce the people on the team here, and then if Dr. Briard is on the other side, he can introduce the people over on, on the east side. But you know, right next to me is Dr. Brad Milliman. He grew up in Detroit, um, but he is our clinical psychologist. He actually, lung cancer is a journey where it's tough, and it's tough for the patients, tough for the family, so Brad can really talk about that, and he's added a lot to our group. In addition, Brad runs a smoking cessation program, so. We know that smoking cessation is a huge part of lung cancer. Not everybody with lung cancer smokes, but that's something we can really do. Sitting next to her, him is Jennifer Wazinski, who really has been a great addition to our team and runs our lung cancer screening program and early detection program. So she is out there trying to spread the word. Um, I think if you had to ask 
anybody in this room, what's, if we had to ask you one thing you could do to really help change the face of lung cancer, I would say that if we can get more people into early detection and find lung cancer early, that's really how we're going to fix lung cancer. I'm really excited about it. So Jennifer um, helps us along with that. Um, Ravinder Clayton is um, a lovely radiation oncologist from Canada who um, is, it's always good to have Canadians, who really <laughs> knows a ton about lung cancer and joined the MD Anderson family probably a year ago and has been just wonderful to work with and really an expert, a leading expert in radiation oncology and the use of radiation in treatment. And the honest truth is the treatment of lung cancer is a team effort. It involves radiation oncologists, the surgeon, the medical oncologist, the interventional pulmonologist, the health psychologist, the screening coordinator. It's a, really a team effort. So Ravinder does a great job with that. Um, Dr. Shah joined me about two years ago, and it's probably the best thing that's happened to me when I started. And he is an interventional pulmonologist. He actually grew up in India, trained in London, and then has come back here. And he's offered amazing things for people that were never offered here in Arizona before for the treatment of lung cancer using techniques through the bronchoscopy. And he's really helpful both in diagnosis and treatment of lung cancer, really advanced. So if there's any questions in the community about that, Dr. Shah would be an expert. And Ashley Labar joined our team about a year ago also, and she's a physician assistant. Um, she grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So um, she actually is the, the, now the, the key cog for our lung cancer screening, our lung cancer multidisciplinary program. You, Ashley sees the patient first, organizes all the tests that you need, and then after that, it goes to committee where we all meet and talk about what treatments. And then on the same day, you can see medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology, and then together figure out what the best plan of treatment is. So that's really what we're trying to represent. And well, I think we can have Jen start talking a little about screening and then kind of naturally evolve into Dr. Shah talking about a little about intervention pulmonary and diagnostics, and then Ashley talking about coordinating the care. And then from there, Dr. Clayton, Dr. Walker, Gary, um, Jason New, and Dr. Briard and I are more on the treatment side. So this is, I think, more of the early detection. And then Dr. Millman provides I think something that's overlooked a lot is the psychological aspects of lung cancer and how it affects you in your treatment. So, Jennifer, do you want to kick sure, it off? Sure, absolutely. My name is Jennifer. I'm one of the nurses that um, runs the nursing um, lung cancer screening, not nursing, lung cancer screening. And my team works together to um, hopefully catch cancer in its earliest stages. Um, I work very closely with all the providers to... Um, review all the scans that, that come through the system, so it's throughout Banner. And um, we actually, I was talking to several of you earlier, we actually review all the ones that um, are a little concerning and provide um, follow-up recommendations to your provider who ordered it. Um, and you know, th that's kind of my passion with this, is let's catch it early so we're not dealing with all the um, chemotherapy and, and things like that. So um, my team does get to do that, which is exciting. Um, and We've had surgeries on many of them that um, did not have to have chemotherapy. So. And there was a national trial that just came out out of Europe. The National Lung Cancer Screening Trial was a trial that came out in the United States that started that push to get lung cancer screening in the United States. But the Nelson trial, preliminary data that came out and it's going to be published soon, shows that in Europe you had even a greater effect of finding lung cancer early. And then there's a Japanese study that instilled lung cancer screening that showed that Right now, 85% of our lung cancer in the United States are found in stage three or above. Um, but in, in Japan, over 90% are now found after implementation of an organized lung cancer screening program at stage one. Or, so it can dramatically change the paradigm. We're not where we are today, but mm -hmm. through the efforts of Jennifer and her team, we're, we're making dents. And I think that's something that everybody who's listening can make a big effort. I went to a talk recently, and for women, the compliance rate for mammography nationwide is probably in the 75 to 80 percent of women get their mammographies done, which is great, right? That's what screen, if, screening is only good if people do it. But for lung cancer right now, of all the eligible people that in the United States are eligible, only 1.3 percent of the people are actively screened. So there's a great opportunity there for us to educate, encourage people to get screened, and the screening criteria will change. As we go from screening, the next step is what do you do if you've found to have a nodule? or how to diagnose or treatment, I think that's where Dr. Shah and his team come in. So one of the key things to realize is that not screening is done to pick up disease when it's not symptomatic, right? And that's the idea. But everything that a CT scan picks up is not cancer. That's the more important thing to realize. Just because there's a positive scan 
does not mean it is cancer. And that's what Jennifer was alluding to, that when there is something found that is a little more suspicious, then we have a multidisciplinary approach where we review those scans, those images, and then decide which are the ones that need to have the next test. The test necessary does not necessarily need to be a biopsy. It could be a PET scan, or it can be a short-term repeat CT scan. If it's going to be a biopsy, then we decide and recommend what is the optimal way to biopsy this particular spot. The spots are small, and hence they're often challenging to get to. Um, there is the conventional radiology method where a needle can be put from the outside to biopsy it. Alternatively now, with advances in bronchoscopy, we can get deep into the lungs and biopsy smaller and smaller tumors or spots successfully and get an answer as to what that spot is about. The advantage of doing it through a bronchoscopy where we use different techniques like navigational bronchoscopy or ultrasound-assisted bronchoscopy, and the newer thing that is coming out now is a robotic-assisted bronchoscopy. Um, we, all of these um, can complement each other. Um, they don't necessarily replace each other, um, but we have these different tools available with which we can nav reach deeper into the lung tissue, get a biopsy, and the advantage is at the same time we can perform biopsies of the lymph nodes, um, which Dr. Kuo had alluded to at the same time. So with one procedure, a patient can have a diagnosis and at least a staging done if they've never had a PET scan before of the spread within the chest. Dr. Kuo, there's, um, there's a question coming in from online, um, uh, which is re relevant to you in particular. Um, after five and a half years um, remission from stage 3B adeno um, with extensive bilateral lymph node involvement, involvement, am I a candidate for surgical resection? So I think the, this opens a whole continuum on the how to treat kind of semi-advanced stage cancer. So when they stage 3B, lung cancer staged 1 to 4. Stage 1 means that it hasn't spread. It's just a small cancer in one area. Stage two means it's spread inside the lung in general, but not outside the lung. Stage three means it's kind of gone into the middle of the chest, which is considered the highway of the body. And stage four means it's spread to the bones and other areas of the body, like the brain. So this patient had what we call stage three disease, which means the lung cancer has spread outside um, the lungs into the what we call the mediastinum, which is the center of the chest. And what it sounds like from this patient is that um, they had what we call bulky are a lot of lymph nodes that are involved. Because when we talk about spread, sometimes it's just going to your neighbor house to get, borrow some sugar. But sometimes you bring the whole family over, right? And, and the spread can be very different. When we talk about spread, it's very generalized. Is it a lot of spread or a little spread? If this patient had spread of cancer, I think they probably got treated with chemotherapy with plus or minus radiation for stage three disease based on five and a half years ago, probably got both. And that patient has done super well. Five and a half years breaks the odds. And, that patient is doing very well. Um, I think that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if there's no signs that the cancer has come back, then I would not offer surgery at this point or anything like that. Because we know that sometimes chemotherapy and radiation can kill all the cancer. And this patient, being five and a half years out, is, is doing well and beating the odds. But if the do cancer does come back, there is consideration of surgery. But I think that you have to weigh the risks and the benefits. So Dr. Clinton can talk about this more. But you know, if they got a lot of radiation. The radiation initially in the first couple of times, the tissue is still soft and still can heal, but after a long term, the radiation can cause some pretty severe scarring that makes surgery more dangerous, where other interventions like Dr. Clayton's intervention or more local therapies like Dr. Shaw and the interventional radiologists are sometimes better. Everything in life, you have to weigh risk versus benefit. So that's where I think that conversation comes in. So um, the, another question online is, uh, how, how do you define a small tumor or a small lesion? What are those parameters? So in, I'll let Dr. Clayton answer that. I mean, um, it, I suppose you can look at it from a very structured staging standpoint. But from uh, I'll comment from a radiation standpoint, and Dr. Koch can comment from a surgical standpoint. Um, for myself, a small tumor is something that I think I can treat with radiation alone to an effective dose 
and kill the tumor without causing too much damage to the surrounding areas. So in terms of actual numbers, we know that radiation alone is very effective for stage one lung cancers, as long as the tumors tend to be less than three centimeters. I know I can safely treat a lung tumor up to about five centimeters while sparing a lot of the lung tissue. Anything beyond that from a radiation standpoint becomes a large tumor. And I, I would agree, I would say that there's a staging system where you can look up a stage one lung cancer is generally under four centimeters. We have the best results for tumors that are under two to three centimeters. So when you do radiation to a tumor, I had it mm -hmm. uh, in my lung, um, it creates a big mess in there. Mm -hmm. And my oncology radiologist told me, oh, within six months it'll be clear. And meanwhile, my medical lung cancer specialist, mm -hmm. oncologist, whatever, said, it's going to make a mess there for a long time. And you, I'm not going to know what's going on there. It's going to make you really nervous because I can't see what's going on. Right. So as a result, I have like brown glass. I have, you know, it cons consolid what they call consolidated area. Mm -hmm. It got grows. It goes, Ugh. So sometimes they say, well, we can't, we really don't know what's going on in there. So every once in a while I have a PET scan to see if any of it lights up. Is that the only way you can tell whether something's going on there? Yeah, and no, that's a great question. So um, unfortunately, unlike surgery, where if you have something removed, you do a scan that day and it's gone. With radiation, what happens is all we're doing is we're preventing those cells from dividing, cancer cells specifically. With very high doses of radiation, we're actually able to kill off a lot of cells. But I often tell patients that any cell in our body has a certain life expectancy. So including our skin cells, our lung cells, our cancer cells. If you leave them alone without giving them any growth medium, they're gonna die off on their own. And that's really what radiation is doing. It's preventing that cell from dividing and creating progeny. So over time, most cancer cells will die off. In the meantime, what we're also doing is radiating normal lung tissue. And the same thing happens there. Um, you know, over time, might be months, might be a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. Those cells will actually fade away as well, and they may not be replaced. And what replaces them is scar tissue. And as you, as I'm sure you've seen with scars that we have on our bodies that we can readily see, they tend to actually, in some ways, fade over time. But do you often notice they get a little bit thicker or more fibrotic over the years? And that's very true with radiation. So after, after radiation, usually we follow you along with CT scans. But if we see something growing, that's less likely to be scar. If it's stable, it's less likely to be cancer. If, it's, if we're not sure, we often get a PET scan. If that PET scan is positive, then we often ask somebody like Dr. Shaw to see you for a biopsy. And that's when we decide, based on the PET scan, mm -hmm. what site to biopsy. It could wax and win, win, like Dr. Clayton pointed out, that it's basically a battle between the cells and your body's own ability to control it after the majority of the cells have been killed by the radiation or whatever therapy you received. I mean, that's the beauty of immunotherapy and that whole, the reason they won the Nobel Prize is that immunotherapy is harvesting your own body's immune system to fight the tumor. So I think the answer to that question after radiation, do we know if the tumor, radiation causes scar, sometimes it's very obvious if the tumor comes back, but I would say majority of the time, radiation has an excellent kill rate, an excellent treatment, so you're probably dealing with scar tissue, and then we're dealing with the question of watching that scar tissue and see if that scar tissue changes. But the problem is that scar tissue will change because it's scar tissue as the body remodels. So is that change because of tumor or is that change because of remodeling? But that's where new techniques and diagnostics or less invasive diagnostics like Dr. Shah and other else can answer some of those questions. That's where you need to find a team approach, not a doctor that's by himself in a solo silo, but uh, a doctor like Dr. Clayton who can get the scan and then talk to Dr. You know, Shaw and Dr. Me and then Dr. New or Ashley and anybody on the treatment team and be like, hey, you know, let is, let, what's, what's the next step? What should we do? And then that's where I think the beauty of a, a team approach is really important. I think we're focusing on, I didn't know if we could have Brad talk about a little bit or Ashley maybe talk first because 
she hasn't had much um, about just what the how to coordinate the care and how the journey is better for the patient. And then maybe Brad talk a little bit about the, something that we ignore. We talk a lot about the treatment, but we often ignore, I think, the social anxiety and the, the mental aspects of cancer and how it's treated. But it, Ashley, do you want to talk about how care coordination, your view of that, and how it can make a better patient experience? Yep, so I'll pick up from where Dr. Shaw left off. Um, so say he got a biopsy, so most people come to me once they're already biopsy proven new cancer usually. Um, so the first step with a new cancer diagnosis is staging. So that usually is my job as we just started the multidisciplinary clinic. Like Dr. Quo mentioned earlier, um, most of the patients come to me. So I'll see them in, in consult, in clinic, um, kind of work them up to stage them. So I, like Dr. Quo said, I'll get all of the tests done probably within a week, a week and a half. And then we usually have multi-D clinics every Mondays. Every, is it every week or every two weeks now? Every week now. Every week. So if they need a PET scan, if they need an EBUS under Dr. Shaw, if they need a brain MRI, um, if, if I think that they're a surgical candidate, usually send them to the cardiologist for cardiac clearance prior to surgery, get the pulmonary function test, have that all done for them. Um, and then, like I said, we, they usually meet every week, every Monday. So we actually have tumor board as well. So usually every Thursday, um, we kind of have a team meeting, you can say, where we all sit down once all of the diagnostic workup is done and discuss what the best option is for them. So we have that opinion there. And then they also meet on Mondays with the radiation with Dr. Clayton, with Dr. Quo, and then my medical oncologist, Dr. Moore. Um, and they sit down with the patient in kind of a one-stop shop. So they'll come in for one visit and see all three of the providers at the same time and walk out with a treatment plan. Yeah, I think what Ashley really adds to the team is that she looks at the diagnostic test as a whole from every specialty. So when you go see a pulmonologist out there in the community, they look at it from a pulmonologist's view. When I go see a surgeon, they order the tests that are necessary for the surgeon. But nobody is looking at what do the tests that everybody needs. And that's where Ashley can really help expedite that and prevent you from bouncing from doctor to doctor to doctor. When they look at what the reason from time to diagnosis or treatment is so long, there's multiple reasons in that pathway. But one of the path reasons is that patients are bouncing from doctor to wait for a test, to come back, back to the doctor, to another doctor to get more tests, and then get bounced back. I, I'm sure people have had that journey. You know, what we want to do with Ashley is, you have lung cancer, let's have somebody that can look at all the perspectives or all the tests at once, get you coordinated for those tests, and then get you so the treatment team has all the answers that they need to make the right treatment decision with you. So I think that is what we're really trying to do locally, both on the east and west side. I think we've lost the east side. They're doing their, their um, thing. but. Um, I don't know if Dr. Milliman wants to talk a little bit about how cancer and that side of the treatment, because that's a, I think the psychological aspect of that treatment is equally as important as the medical treatment. I'm a big believer that people that feel like they can beat the disease or are feeling positive do much better than patients that have been defeated. Hello, so I'm Dr. Milliman. I am a clinical psychologist, as we talked about. Um, I do a lot of things with pretty much all of these providers taking referrals from them. Uh, on the personal and professional side, I've kind of seen the effect that cancer can have on people. It's not just anxiety and depression like most people go to, right? We talk a lot about body image issues with the way your body changes during all of these different types of treatments, different surgeries. Um, we talk a lot about medications. There's a whole lot that I can do the average patient spends between five to six minutes in the room with a provider, which is obviously not a lot of time. So, and a majority of the time, the provider is doing the talking, so patients get left with a lot of questions, which is great why we have these kind of living room uh, seminars. But part of what I can do is help you process what you've heard. Most patients, when they find out they have cancer, don't even hear what the doctor says for the next 15, 20 minutes, and they have so many questions that go unanswered. So we kind of help you manage that, especially if you have a limited social support. Um, I also help people either during, for, or after with smoking cessation. 
Not every patient who smokes has lung cancer, not everyone who has lung cancer smoked. But it's definitely a big part of what we see. Um, I help people to quit because obviously quitting smoking is good for you, but everybody would say, well, I've tried, but I've tried just the patch, or I've tried Chantix, or I've tried you know, anything that they see on TV. But why do I keep going back to it? So we like to look at the behaviors that help you see specifically why you're smoking, what was going on that got you to start smoking, and what we can do to help you quit smoking. I really need to thank Bonnie Darrell for giving us the opportunity to reach out to the people in the room, the people in the East Valley, the people on the internet to, to really ask questions. I think we focused a lot on the, the patient side today, and I think that's important. The actual treatment side questions, we can always answer too. So, you know, Bonnie, I really thank Bonnie Adario and the foundation for their continued support. And I really thank them for being a leader in lung cancer. I went to a breast cancer walk um, with my wife for a friend of ours, and there were thousands and thousands of people, thousands of awareness. And I know at dinner tables, people talk about breast cancer very freely, but you know, I think what Bonnie Adario is trying to do is try to change that stigma, change that perception. Over the dinner room table, you can have a talk about lung cancer. Should you get screened, should you not get screened? I encourage that everybody listening, everybody in the room, you are the future of helping us cure lung cancer and beat lung cancer because it's the conversations about lung cancer that are create awareness that allow Bonnie Adario and everybody else to do what they do to try to beat this disease. So really, Bonnie Adario giving us the opportunity to do this was very special. I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together and it could be just you and me will be family just wait and see